All right, here we are. Interview number three for Rise Above. Arun Sharma. Will you state your name and record, occupation, birthday, passport number, and DNA sequence, please? <laughs> exactly. Retinal scan. <laughs> rectal scan. <laughs> rectal exam. When was your last rectal exam? Oh, last night. <laughs> Self-inflicted. Nice, nice. Um, so, let's see here. Question number one is, uh, what is your history with motorcycles? Oh man, uh, my dad used to ride. My dad never had a. He's never had a car license. He only rode a scooter my whole life. He started with a little moped, a little pooch, pook, pooch. How you say it? He had a little pooch moped when I was like young, young, young. Grew up in Hawaii, and we and only my mom had a car, but my dad only had mopeds and then scooters. And so I always rode scooters. And then I got my first paper route when I was like whatever, like paper route age, like 14 or 13. And uh, I was old enough to. I knew how to ride the scooter even though it was illegal, so my dad would just let me ride it. So I would use the scooter for the Sunday morning paper route. So during the five days a week or six days a week that I did normal paper delivery, I had to use my bicycle. But Sunday mornings, we deliver paper at like three or four o'clock in the morning and it's dead, there's nobody out. So my dad would let me use his scooter. So that's how I learned riding two wheels and I freaking loved it, right? And then so all I did is ride scooters. I always wanted a motorcycle because they were like the grown up version of a scooter. And I used to watch this unreal show called Kikaida, which is a Japanese, like the early days of the Power Rangers. And it was all about these two brothers who rode around on motorcycles and sidecars and they turned into robots. And the whole the whole show had crazy like motorcycles. Crazy motorcycles. I was like, that's so stuff. rad. <laughs> so I went to college and I just once I was out of the house, I bought my first bike with my own, you know, I got a job and I set up some money and I bought a nineteen eighty five Hawk 450. Blue. Blue. Yeah. And didn't you just see that? I did. And not the exact, just I mean, not the, the bike, but the same, yeah. same I did, bike. I was, I, in saw New, I was in Chicago or New York, and it was exactly my bike. I was tripping out. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, so I guess it's hard to say what motors. The, the next question is what motorcycle are you currently riding? But a man that has access to pretty much yeah, any motorcycle. Yeah, I, I guess I should say what, what's your favorite bike, if, that, if you can answer that. It's the cheesiest answer of all time, but it's so fucking true. Whatever I'm riding, like, I'm straight riding. up. So if I had to choose like favorite bikes, like I have that crazy Icon scooter, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It doesn't really airbags. Like, it, yeah, it goes like 23 <laughs> miles an hour, and it doesn't turn. It scrapes, but that thing makes me so happy. It's retarded. And then I have a Diablo, and that bike is awesome. Never ridden um, one yet, but they I, I don't know. There's, yeah. but there, there's so many good bikes. And, yeah. And for me, like running that shop, I get to ride everything. Like a new trade in will come in, and I'll be like, I want to see what today a guy traded in an RC51. Remember from back in yeah, the day? Yeah. And then I'm like, I want to ride that. So it'd be cool because I'll go take that for two days. But my bikes that I ride, like that I own, that are my favorites, are all Ducati. And not because I'm biased, but this. So because they're the best. Yeah, I just love them. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, totally. Um, Big question, fairly vague, but big. Um, why do you ride? I guarantee you everyone's going to tell you the same thing, right? It's, it sounds cheesy, same thing, but it's like it's freedom. It's the closest thing to flying. You know, you can just get in your head or get out of your head, right? Right. And just go on your own. You can be spontaneous. And I love that when you're on a motorcycle, even the most mundane things become entertainment. So if I have to go from my house to the bank and I'm in a car... I've just wasted those minutes in my life. But if I go from my house to the bank and I'm on my motorcycle, suddenly I'm in a video game and it's awesome and, you and got it's a mission. fun and it's great, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you add two wheels to anything you're doing and instantly it becomes like larger than life, right? It's, exactly. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so there's obviously people in, that I'm interviewing that have been in lots of accidents or just one, but I guess... Uh, what what was the most serious accident you've been in? Oh, man. I've been in two serious accidents. I don't count any crashes on the on. I don't count like any race crashes right. as accidents because you're, you're right. racing, right? But I had I've only been in two accidents on the street, and unfortunately, both were bad. The one that was the worst actually didn't have it. I didn't have a lot physically happen to me, but you know about that. My I was riding, and my friend and I were side by side. We both. You want to hear the whole accident? You want to hear what happened, or? Well, you're talking detail? about you're, you're Man, talking with Manuel. Yeah, I mean, I guess more of the one, the one that's like physically. The one that physically 
fucked me up the most was, was July 19th, 1992. I'll never forget. And I was in Mesa, Arizona. I was gradu I graduated from college, and I didn't know where I wanted to live. So I knew I wanted to live west of Wisconsin, so I got on my, my 87 Magna, and I went with a buddy of mine who had a CX-500 Honda. And we went up and down through every state west of Wisconsin to see where we want to live. We had a great time. We were on the road for two months, relatively new to motorcycling. So my safety gear was, I wore cowboy boots because I was in Wisconsin. So I had cowboy boots, jeans, a decent showy helmet. I don't even know what kind of gloves I had, and I had a motorcycle-esque jacket that I bought at Macy's in New York when I was there for a visit. And that was it. That was my gear. Um, I was on a, so we were on the road for two months. We were in Mesa, Arizona. It was 118 degrees, and I was like, fuck it. This is way too hot for gear. I didn't know any better, but it was also the only day on a two-month trip that I didn't have my jacket on when I was riding. I got, uh, I got hit. I got T-boned at an intersection. Um, the guy driving didn't even see me. He was timing lights, and he was looking to the left, and I would have been to his right. And when he looked up, my bike was sitting right there. So he hit me at 40. He hit me about 45 miles an hour. I uh, I must have seen him coming because nothing happened to my left leg, even though the side of the bike was demolished. And like I jumped off the bike, and I don't remember anything because uh, I got I was knocked out. But that's what people have told me. So I got hit by this car. I got thrown over the hoods of three three cars. And they said I landed on my head like a cartoon. They said my legs were straight up in the air, my head was on, bouncing on the ground, and I just bounced with the momentum on the side of my helmet, just my, my body in the air until the momentum stopped, and then I slumped over my side. I was completely knocked out. I landed on my left side, and, uh, and they didn't want to move me because it turned out I, had a, I broke my back. And so it took them like however like 45 minutes before the life flight and everything to come out. And in that time, because the road was so hot, literally the road cooked my arm. So I got this huge, so I broke my back and I broke my shoulder. Um, but the most painful part was I got a third degree burn. The, the asphalt actually. Yeah, it cooked. It, I, got, I got zero road rash. I didn't scrape anything, but because I was lying on the side. Like an exhaust burn. Yeah, just yeah. On the, on the like, 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 like holding your arm on a fucking hot stove. Right. So I got third degree burns from my knuckles all the way up, by, all the way up my arm. Whew. And then, so then you were you were life flighted. You I was life flighted. I woke up in the hospital. Um, when I woke up, they the first thing I was in the ER, and they kind of admitted me, and my my arm was full of like crud, right, like rocks right. and debris and whatnot, debris. So they take me to this big stainless steel like hot tub with disinfectant, and they said, all right, they said, and they had a big like a like a scrub brush. And they said, you can do this or we can do this. And so I said, I guess I'll do it. So I had to sit there in this sanitized hot tub with my third degree burned arm with no, I had no painkillers and, and, and a scrub brush. And I had to scrub all the dead flesh, or all the, just the scar and all the rocks and everything out of my arm. It was awesome. Most painful thing you can actually think of probably. No, no, actually, so I didn't know much and I was young, and the doctor didn't give me a lot of information, so they said you can do a skin graft, or you can let your, your arm, I said, well, I, you, know, the, you know, they explained that basically they take skin off your ass, and right, off the yeah, back of your leg, right. they put it on your arm. And uh, I didn't, and so to me, my logic was, well, I already have one big, I, I have missing skin on one part of my body already, Right. why would I now have, why well, would I just switch <laughs> missing it, Missing skin right? on my ass. Right, why would legs. I go from, right. right. So they didn't explain, they didn't explain it well. They didn't say, I mean, I, to this day, no one's explained it, but I'm sure they would have said something like, we take a very thin layer and it heals very quickly. Right. But they didn't tell me that. They just, I just said, well, no, it doesn't make sense to me. I'll just let it grow back. Yeah. And they said, okay. So that took like three years because it was a third degree burn. It was so And it was so bad. Burned. So it just took forever. And the worst part about it isn't skin growing back. It's that they don't tell you that skin, skin doesn't grow back flexible. So three times a day, it's I would have to, it's, well, it's, it's stiff. Yeah. So I would have to literally three times a day get my arm to do full mobility, mobility which basically means like it's the same sensation as ripping your skin off your body. So three times a day, I'd have to do that. And it would take me like an hour and a half of just like this fucking excruciating pain. Wow. It was horrible. Man. That's, that's, that's pretty bad. Um, I guess after that... <laughs> What, what was the hardest part about recovery if that wasn't? That was. That was. That was easily so the hardest part. I mean, 
the hardest yeah because yeah, the was, way i broke my back like it was a i, I cracked two vertebrae and there was just there were just things that just had to heal over time and your shoulder it wasn't like a split but i had a crack down my whole left shoulder right and that just had to grow back so the hardest thing was that and it took so long and i'd have to every day same process i'd have to scrub my arm down to make it clean i'd have to apply a ton of like neosporin so it'd always be moist i'd have to put fresh bandages wrap it in gauze so it'd be compressed put a sleeve on a compression sleeve on it and then and i do it every day and it took years and years and years when even when it finally so grew you said back, three plus years oh yeah. to to condition that arm yeah and wow. it was probably it was probably like a year and a half of like the whole skin tearing off your arm sensation where like it took, however long it took to grow back it was I don't remember now, but it was like, I mean, yeah, it was, it took forever. The actual, like, skin growing back part probably was six months to a year. Wow. Um, I advise a skin graft. Skin graft. Yeah, go for the skin graft. Go for the skin graft. Um, How, let's see here. Um, How long were you away from riding after that accident? Uh... A year? A year. Because okay. I couldn't use my arm. Yeah. Like, it was literally, like, too... Like, it would you know. But as soon as I could ride again... I, I mean, even when I had the accident, when my uh, my friend came to visit me who was on the road trip with, and I was like, dude, I'll be fine. I'll just grab my arm up, and then we'll just go buy, an, I'll buy another bike with insurance money, and we'll go. So, yeah. mentally, I just wanted to keep going. Right. But it didn't work out that way. So, yeah, it was probably... So, then I went home to Hawaii to recuperate, moved to Portland right after that, and then... Uh, Man, what was my first bike? And then I got a bike in Portland. And were you were you scared to get back on after after that? Or like, because you said mentally you were. The, I, I I borrowed a, a friend of mine in Hawaii had a um, a friend of mine in Hawaii had. Hey. Don't look at my my Trader coffee cup here. We're in, we're, we're interviewing about horrible things. Oh, I'll leave you to it. I'm gonna grab a drink. Um, so I had a friend in Hawaii that had a GSXR 1100 a 92. And I remember that bike scared the crap out of me because it was more, way more bike than I'd ever ridden. But it was the only person I knew how to bike. So he said, and I, I knew that if I didn't get back on a bike, I would probably like lose, you know, like get gun shy. So I wanted to get on a bike as soon as I could. So as soon as I felt like I could actually ride, even I mean, I couldn't ride at distance, but just to get back on a bike. So I remember I got on this bike. I was shit scared. I was completely paranoid. I thought every car was going to hit me. But I rode for like 35 or 40 minutes. My arm was killing me. And then I, but I, I got out of my system, and it was cool. And then I just waited, and I got back on a bike. And I don't know, it was so long ago. I was probably gun shy for a little while, but not, not really, because I knew, like, you know, shit doesn't happen like that every day. Yeah. Um. How many, how many accidents have you been in? I guess you're not considering the, the crashes on the, the track, but just in general, the course Two. of right. Two. Two. Um. Three. Three. What gives you the strength to keep writing? I guarantee everyone who answers all this shit is gonna sound so cliche, right? But it's gotta be true for everybody. Like, you know, well, like life's always gonna knock you down. Like there's a thousand just today I was reading this cool article about like that uh, ride apart put online, they're like thirteen things that are more dangerous than motorcycling. You know? And it's just normal life. Like people more people die just tripping and falling than right, they do on right. motorcycles, right? So you know, if it's something that you love, I mean, it's so funny to me, people always, because people always ask that question, but nobody asks somebody after they have a bad breakup, how will you ever love, how will you, oh, so you, why would you possibly have another relationship, right? They don't do that. If you get food poisoning, nobody says, oh, you better not eat anymore. So it's so, it's funny to me that motorcycles have this weird, unique stigma where there's everything in the world that shitty things happen, and you just assume that that's just part of life and you have to do it, yeah. but somehow with motorcycles, it's di- what the fuck's the difference? Right. Right? So, I mean, so getting on a motorcycle is, is easier than a, a bad breakup. Dude, in, in a million years. <laughs> fuck, I'll take a bike rack over a breakup any day. <laughs> there you go. That's a good quote right there. Um, that's a good quote. You like chess. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, my God. Oh, this is a good one. Do your do your friends and family support you continuing to ride? Um, mostly. I mean, I definitely have friends who don't. Basically, it's the same thing every time, right? It's people who aren't part of that world who view it as from the outside. They view it as dangerous. They view it as risky. They view it as it's an alternative. But it's but you know, and maybe it's like not as dramatic. But but again, it, when people who don't ride. 
try to talk to other people who do ride about why would you do that and you should just give it up. It, it reminds me of like, like go back five or ten years and be like, oh, you just shouldn't be gay, right? <laughs> Oh, okay. I'll just, I'll just won't be gay. I just yeah, won't be. I just, love I, doing I just this. won't be black, right? right I mean, right. it's part of, it's part of who you are and what you do. It's a choice. It's something you want to do. There's a lot of people who ride where if they don't ride, they lose their shit. Yeah. Like it's their release. Motorcycles I mean, in the blood. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Totally. Um, so, what gear? I, you already said what gear you were wearing in the accident. <laughs> yeah. um, but what gear do you wear currently oh, when you everything. ride? I, I, will ne- I will now. Na- I will never ride. Well, I take it back. I take it back. This. I haven't been able to cross the the, the pants thing. Like, if I'm gonna go for a ride, if I'm gonna come here from my house and get a coffee, helmet, boots, gloves, jacket, the whole nine yards. Jeans. Jeans. Yeah. Well, totally. So the cool thing is now, at least that industry is now making cool, comfortable jeans With that knee are. Pads, yeah. Things like so, that. So so now I will ride that. So I've got a few pairs of like casual, but I'll admit like. That's a recent thing. I mean, I've been riding now for 20 some years. Yeah. And only recently can I say that I ride with full protection. If you count protective gear, jeans as protection. Right. Now I can say I ride with full protection all the time. Right. Right. Um, so last, the last question is kind of two questions. Do you feel like you have become a stronger rider and person since your accident? And what has changed about your riding? So, yeah, so two part. First thing is, I think that there's different kinds of accidents. And unfortunately, both of mine were really bad. Um, I think I have three birthdays because I had, in the two accidents that I had, they were both really severe. And the first one, I almost died. Um, and you wake up in a hospital and you're all fucked up. And the second one, I was in an accident and my friend did die. There were two of us on two bikes and he crashed and he died in the accident. And that was a big wake up. And so I think that a big part of it is that you have this like incredible wake up call. So a lot of people who go through life relatively unscathed, they realize in their 40s or 50s or 60s about all these things they need to do to live their life before it's over. So I think the bittersweet or the silver lining of these accidents is that like at 21 years old and at 20 and at 30 years old I got these real wake ups like hey life could end tomorrow and you better live your life as every day is your last but not in that bullshit cliched kind of way that people do it like actually do things because you just don't fucking know and that was the best life lesson I could ever learn. Um, and as far as being a better rider you know I've been motorcycling my whole life being part of the shop and doing track I, I will say I never actively pursued trying to be a better rider when I was younger I didn't know there were options I just thought you rode and then became a better rider now that I know about track schools and riding schools and resources like I push that on everybody I know because there are now there are really easy ways to be a better rider that didn't exist to everybody years ago so that's a huge deal right. 